Twilight's Incomplete and Short Guide to Equestrian Magical Theory Chapter 1, Magic by Pony Type Many equestrians lack a basic knowledge of a magical theory. Some unicorns, yes, but mainly earth ponies and pegasi. For this, I cannot blame those that are not aware of this part field, since they have mostly no use for it. However, why not many equestrians know that it is even an earth pony or a pegasus, it is very possible to manipulate magic. This is on a lower level than most unicorns, but a skilled pegasus, or even earth pony, can easily levitate, for example, a book. Maybe you're asking why you've never seen any ponies apart from unicorns use magic, but the answer to this is simple. Ponies don't know this, but the education system in Equestria has been on the rise for many years, which has resulted in more educated ponies, but most ponies still aren't very well educated compared to your average pony in Princess Celestial School, for Gifted Unicorns, or another private canter lot, Manhattan, or Cloud Seraph School. These schools are rare, f and for most ponies, instead choose to enter a state-run school. These schools have recently been sent more funding as the need for equestrian military force dies down and the economy for our country rises, but I digress. We are not here to talk about equestrian politics, of course. The fact of the matter is that most unicorns who go to private schools and knowledge of man magical manipulation is exceedingly rare. It is knowledge I have stumbled on for only a year and kept for this book. See, the average pony body accesses ambient magic via a series of vein-like objects underneath the skin. Magic is ethereal, so it passes through the fur and skin and it is caught by these veins. This magic is then transported through the body and concentrated in certain areas of the body which have thicker magical veins. In a unicorn, it is obviously concentrated into the horn, which manipulates magic with a horniglyphamine organ. This organ is located directly underneath the thick chitinous shell of the horn, which is why hitting the horn of a unicorn can be very, very painful. A magical vein, the thickest of any, is completely encompassed by a horniglyphamine, which allows the horniglyphamine to absorb and manipulate the magic when it passes through. The horniglyphamine uses a process called deetherealization to turn the magic from raw form when it arrives into a refined gas-like form that can be manipulated by the horniglyphamine with the will of a unicorn. However, more on deetherealization, the horniglyphamine and other unicornic magics in chapter later on, this is after all a chapter on magic by pony type, nothing else. So. The horniglyphamine is what allows unicorns such as polished and efficient manipulation of magic. All ponies in Equestrian know that Pegasi and Earth ponies have some sort of ambient magic. And Earth ponies helps them with work of the Earth, and the magic of a Pegasus is what allows them to fly with their wingspan, and weigh as well with the interaction and with manipulating mainly clouds. But this is not all their magic does. The magic of a Pegasus is sent through the magical veins, henceforth modes, and is eventually distributed through the body. This magic in its raw form effectively lightens the pegasus, making them weigh much, much less. There is no special concentration at any point in the body. The manipulation of clouds in the meanwhile is actually caused by the equivalent of a horniglyphamine located into the hooves, which is why their hooves of a pegasus are often much harder than your average pony of another race. This organ is called the hoofoglyphamine, and is effectively acts as the same as the horniglyphamine. However, the hoofoglyphamine is much less refined. A magically skilled and knowledgeable pegasus can still levitate, maybe make a simple bubble shield, and cast a stun spell, but never in equestrian history has a pegasus been able to access a higher level spell, such as teleportation, or maybe materialization. As an upside, the hoofoglyphamine has a sort of passive effect with it. It interacts with the magic trapped in the cloud matter, more on that in later chapter, allows a pegasus a skilled manipulation of the cloud. It does the same with the rainbows and other things. An earth pony, meanwhile, has magic concentrated in slightly thicker modes near their organs, effectively sending them in a sort of overdrive. Again, more anatomy in a later chapter. This allows blood to be pumped around the body faster, proving the myths of earth ponies ha being heavyweights true, and is why earth ponies are generally related to things such as stamina and nature. As Pegasi and Unicorns, an Earth Pony also has a magical organ located into the exact center of the body. This is the base glyphamine. You may notice it is not spelled as the hoof glyphamine or the horniglyphamine, and this is because it has a different purpose. 
Albite not incredibly different, the base glyphamine is actually acting as a magnet for magic, attracting it in a raw form to itself through the body. It then pumps out most of the magic towards the modes, but leaves some to itself, a calculated 10% or so. This 10% is used to interact with any living thing. Accelerating their growth or making their own organs more efficient through this effect is lost on larger creatures such as ponies, griffins, etc. And the effect on smaller creatures such as plants, maybe dogs, is clear. Plants receive accelerated growth, growth as the magic leaves the base glyphamine, not something a hornoglyphamine or hoofoglyphamine can do, and interacts with its own modes in a similar way to the earth ponies. Dogs and other small animals will receive extended lives as the magic flows through their modes, fading away slowly, but making their bodies more effective in general. In short, this effect is like when the base glyphamine does to an earth pony, except temporary. Lasting between a week and a year, depending on the strength of a base glyphamine and the amount of time the earth pony spent with the animal before leaving. On that note, I think I shall end this chapter here. I hope you enjoyed the first chapter and learned a lot that you didn't know. Oh, one final thing, just to clear it up. An earth pony cannot perform magic like a pegasus, or especially a unicorn, since there is no magic or finding organ in their body. Take a break from reading, my studious reader, and come back when you're ready. Chapter 2. Magic Proper Magic proper is what many magical theorists call any theory about magic itself. For example, if you were to say that you can think magic came from aliens that gifted it to us, then regardless of how absolutely ridiculous and unlikely that theory was, then it would be a theory about magic proper. In this chapter, I'll go into a bit of detail about what magic is, or at the very least, what we currently know about it, and what we don't, the theories for what we don't, and the theories that cut out what we think we already know. For example, many of you heard of the Theory of Magical Limitation, which is a paper written by Joseph Hooves, the most famous Earth Pony scientist, on the world having a limited amount of magic and with each raising of the sun and moon. Or any other minor, major, or ambient magic is slowly being used up. It isn't widely accepted in the magical science community, but it is the most popular outside of it, mostly due to dramatization of it in multiple novels and now films. First of all, what most of us magical scientists think it is definitely proven to be a fact about magic is we know absolutely that magic is not a kind of matter as everything else. It doesn't take the form of anything along the lines of an atom or quark. Instead, the magic is a type of protonormal matter, the only one of its kind. For anyone who doesn't know, a protonormal think is something we do not know anything about and was supposedly around before anything was considered normal, from gravity to the weak force to the strong force to, well, the universe. An ever-encompassing infinite wave or particle, etc. This is the main reason the theory of magical limitation isn't accepted. It presents magic as something that can run out, and we're all, to put it lightly, pretty sure that it won't. Apart from that, and that everything else on this planet can interact with magic, ponies just aren't sure about magic. However, there are a whole lot of theories that discuss it, and I'm going to shorten a few down to them to fit this in the chapter. I want you to be able to comfortably read one at a time after... Although I cannot tell you about them, all since there are so very many. Because of this, we'll be going over the most popular and widely accepted first and foremost. To begin, there's a theory of portal-based magic leak, which presents magic as something that is leaked into our universe from the Void. The Void is a legend that has been around for tens of thousands of years, telling of a place beyond our sight that extends forever, while being completely and utterly empty, ruled by a single cold yet wrathful being. However, most ponies actually still believe in this, and there is a ground for a belief in the Void. Multiple attempts at artificial magic teleportation has resulted in everything going through it apparently at the end node with strange unidentified black wisps hovering around them and then fading. Ponies report magic being stronger around these areas, specifically by around one mitigral, a unit of measurement for the strength of magic. The typical average around the world being a thousand, occasionally stronger around artifacts or certain plants and creatures that have adapted to manipulate magic in some way, usually drawing it closer and extending their lives more on this in a later chapter. Otherwise, ponies have tested this and have disappeared for a length of time, instead of instantly appearing in the next spot, 
an entire second goes by, and then when they reappear, they are found dying for no apparent reason, unable to talk with the same wisps of black fading away. The theory of portal-based magic leak uses a lot of proof for the existence of the void, and then goes on to explain that magic entered into this world through a portal opened by early ponies momentarily by accident tens of thousands of years ago, that supposedly caused the mass extinction event colloquially known as the Falling, simply because we just don't know what killed most things. Theoretically, without having evolved to handle the presence of magic and interacting with it, organic creatures died off, with only a few being forcibly evolved by magic itself. How this happened is unknown, and is really the only thing that doesn't make this definitive. Magic doing something without being used is unheard of, and otherwise a thousand years ago, that mad scientist sociopath did multiple experiments on removing magical organs from creatures and finding that they died rather violently. As well as this, magic moves at the speed that couldn't possibly be ever measured while in a raw form, and it is very possible that a momentarily hole between the void and our universe could have caused this. Another theory, Coltington's Tyria de la Simulacion, or Theory of Simulation, presents us with a rather simple thesis. He states in his paper that absolutely and positively, the world we live in does not exist. The magic is unknown because we're not meant to know about it, and we'll never really learn of anything about it, because magic is the simulation we live in that forbids it. A rather popular theory, it can't exactly be disproved, which leads to this disappointingly being a theory that could be true. Finally and arguably the most important thing is the Ansigbar philosophy von Interstaki, or Invisible Theory of Interaction. This theory is still influential today while being passed down by spoken word 1,000 years ago by a supposedly mad family wandering the Saharia Desert of early Zeprica. It forms a solid theory that magic is actually not something that exists, though not in the same way as Tyria del Simulacion says. In fact, it says that creatures throughout the planet actually manipulate with the fundamental forces of reality. Gravity, the weak force, the strong force, the speed of light, and others. It doesn't explain how, but in reality it doesn't really have to, since magic is completely unknown and we supposedly interact with it while not being able to explain what it is, or even after this, completely sure it exists. So why do we say that it exists? Why do we... why do we say that? Surely it's possible that instead of interacting with what basically is a mythical thing, we interact with something that we can actually say exists. Well. Those are the three most influential theories in the scientific community to this day. If you want to know which one I believe in the most, it would be the Ansigbar philosophy von Interstraki, since the zebras really do know both science and magical science, and have long before us ponies, though arguably we advance faster today. Please, if this inspires you to investigate magic further, then there are multiple books referenced at the end. Go ahead and check them out at the library or bookstore.